Hi, everyone. Deborah Hamilton. I'm so glad to be here. I hope you and your pets made it through the 4th of July. Uh, we are on our once a month meetings and I'm missing all of you, but enjoying the fact that uh, all of us have Wednesday nights sort of kind of free. Um, and everyone here hopefully has made a map plan so your pets are cared for. I know that I was putting out notices almost two weeks. Hi, Paul, almost two weeks before the 4th of July, reminding everyone to have identification on their dogs, to make sure their dogs are in a quiet place, have their dogs maybe on a leash, have two or three um, barriers to exit from your house in the event you know they get frightened. Uh, and dogs that don't always jump over fences may jump over fences on the 4th of July. So it really was important for people to take that extra moment. So I'm Deborah Hamilton. I am the coordinator of the MAP community call. I've made the MAP plan now, I guess it's 10 years ago, because I broke my ankle in 2013, which started the whole ball rolling here, where I realized now I was the only one on earth who, if something happened to me, my pets would not be cared for because my husband was caring for me. So we've really grown. I'm so thrilled for everyone being here. I'm so thrilled uh, for all the people who've created a MAP plan to care for their pets. Um, and if you didn't know, I will be speaking at the uh, virtually at the Animal Medical, Medical Center, the Schwarzman um, Animal Medical Center in New York. And I'll be talking about the MAP plan to all of their owners. And that will be next Wednesday at six o'clock, not 6.30. Um, the link will be in the notes in case anybody wants to sign up. It's free. Uh, but I would love for you to come so you can all ask questions because I might forget something or I only have about oh, I guess 40 minutes to talk and then take some questions. So I would love for all of you to join me to make sure I uh, miss meet, meet all our points. I was talking to Rose today because I'm going through the training PowerPoint and it was amazing to me how much I have changed over the years because every time I rewrite the map plan, it always gets better. Uh, so I, I really am thrilled to have been asked to do that. But tonight I'm going to talk about getting a new puppy um, or getting a young dog and what the benefits of getting a new dog and what you should know before you get that new dog uh, and what you should do once you get the new dog. And I will be honest with you, the reason I'm talking about this tonight is because my neighbor, who I love, um, she got a brand new golden retriever puppy off of Craig's list. Uh, the woman who is selling the golden retrievers, her husband passed away. And so she has been sort of having, no pun intended, a fire sale um, on her dogs, her older dogs and her younger dogs. And um, so this dog is the cutest thing in the world, not very well socialized. Um, and unfortunately, if any of you have golden retrievers, you will know that they map behind the ears. Uh, luckily, Irish setters don't map behind the ears. I don't know if Tonka mats behind the ears or if um, Katie mats behind the ears. I know that the Wheatons don't map behind their ears um, and Irish setters don't. And But some people take scissors to them. And I can tell you that my dachshunds sometimes would mat. And there was one time when I almost cut my dog because I pulled the mat up and I was going to cut and there was the skin. Um, so this puppy had um, five. Um, you know, um, sort of like uh, octagon slits where they'd come and just cut the skin and the hair, boom, right away. And it was open and it was terrible. And I felt so bad. And, and I actually said to her, I swear to God, I didn't do this because I had taken the puppy to look at its hotspots. They thought she had hotspots and she does have hotspots, but she also has cuts. Um, when you're looking for a puppy, it is imperative to make sure that you know who you're buying from. That doesn't mean there aren't, you know, wonderful vet uh, pet breeders out there who may or may not show their dogs, who may or may not health test their dogs. However, you know, buyer beware, you get what you pay for. Uh, if you want it right away, I know we've talked about this a zillion times. If you want it right away, yes, on Craigslist, you can get some of this wo woman's dogs. Now my, my neighbors are 85 and 91, and they are currently now, um, living with a completely untrained 18-month-old um, golden retriever. And this isn't, as my other neighbor on the other side said, this is an orthopedic nightmare waiting to happen 
because this puppy is the sweetest dog you'd ever want to know. However, she is going in and out of their feet and they're not stable to begin with. I mean, I'm not stable and I'm 65. So I feel comfortable saying that when I'm 85, I'll be less stable than I am now. I'm hoping not too bad, but I'm sure I will not. And this puppy, although she is such a lovely girl, she's 18 months old. She was running a muck in a pack um, at the Craigslist breeders in um, North Carolina here on the Eastern shore. And uh, she really was a pack animal. And I know because my dogs were pack animals in Armonk. We had um, sometimes nine dogs and all of them would rotate up through the house. And I know, Connie, you've probably seen people with lots of Wheatons and they run in packs. And the ability for you to really train your dog, you have to be diligent. You have to take everybody out. You have to have them have manners. My husband always was amazed that I could flip a dog in and out of our house and they would never not know what the rules were. Uh, but when they're running in a pack, if you don't take the time to teach them the rules, it can be a problem. So when you're going to pick up your puppy, ask a few questions. It is so important. So you of course want to ask if the dog is AKC registered, which is better than not. It could be UKC registered, which is a different registration. Um, it has its own dog shows. It has its own life of its own. Uh, every, I think, kennel club has its own positives and negatives. So I don't have a negative thing to say about uh, any of them. Uh, but if it's registered, that's always good. If it's not registered because it's a Labradoodle, it's a Golden Doodle, it's a Burner Doodle, um, ask if its parents were registered. Because what you want to know is if the dogs that were bred to make the Doodle uh, were dogs that were well bred before they were made a doodle um, or were before they were brought together to make doodles. Sorry. Um, so you want to ask if the dogs that were bred to make the doodles had been health tested for all the Bernese um, maladies that are uh, put uh, set forth on their national um, website. You want to know if they um, did the poodle as well. So that's really the first question. You want to ask that before you go. And I will tell you why you want to ask that before you go. I know Connie is going to say, of course, because when you see little puppies or cute little dogs, even 18 months running around, uh, it is very hard to walk out of that door without a dog because you see them all running around. You know, you can give them a great life. Like my neighbor's dog has absolutely hit the lotto because they will take beautiful care of her forever. Um, I am hoping, I'm knocking on wood, that it gives them a whole new lease on life and both of them outlive Maya. Um, but this is something that's really important for people um, to pay attention to when you're getting a new puppy. So you want to ask them if the dogs are registered, uh, ask them if the dogs have been health tested, um, ask them if the parents are on site. Now I'll tell you that there are Hardly any times if it's a reputable breeder who might want to get an outcross from something and is using, you know, frozen semen or fresh chilled semen, the stud dog might not be on the premises because they wanted to get an outcross. So it isn't fatal if both parents aren't on the premises. You should be able to get information about the stud dog. You should be able to call the stud dog's owner um, and talk to them as well. It's something you should do because it is, you want to know what the boy is like, right? You want to know what the dad is like. You want to know what the mom is like, and you're probably going to meet the mom. Um, my neighbor said that she never saw any puppies, although the woman listed on Craigslist that she had many uh, because they were looking for an older dog. Uh, so remember, when you're going to pick a dog, just make sure that you um, ask questions and ask to see at least the mother, maybe some of the siblings. And if it's a repeat breeding, see what the siblings, the you know older brothers and sisters um, look like. It's very, very important. Also, you want to make sure that the dog has seen a vet um, and you want to know when it was wormed. It should come with all of these directions with it. And uh, I didn't ask my neighbor if she got all of that. I think she said she got papers and she got some health things. Um, so that's great. However, when you, you find a dog on Craigslist, and as we all know, it's really hard to get a dog these days. 
Uh, so people rush out and get the dog because they don't want to miss it. They don't want to miss the dog. And uh, I get it because I wouldn't want to miss any of my dogs either. However, um, just be a little more questioning when you call. And if the person gets a little angry with you because you're asking questions about the mother or the father or the health testing, uh, calm them down and say, I just need to know a few questions or maybe take that as something that, or someone you won't be able to deal with later because ultimately if the dog doesn't work out, you want to be able to return the dog and get your money back or you know, at least be able to um, release the dog to somebody else if you can't get the money back, maybe sell it to someone else. Uh, and if you don't get all the warm and fuzzy feelings from your breeder, this might not be the person for you. <clears throat> and I stress that you really want a breeder as a mentor because your dog is going to go through different stages of its life. When you get it home as a puppy, it's a cute little puppy, 18 months old, as anyone who has had a dog at 18 months of age knows, they are teenagers. They are testing their boundaries. They are being naughty, which of course they're supposed to do. And really you will need someone um, to either guide you, maybe a YouTube video, or maybe they have many, many trainings online. Really getting dogs, puppies under control before they're 18 months old is ideal. But as my neighbor has an 18 month old, now she'll be starting with a few bad habits um, that she'll have to work through. So before I go on any longer, because I've already talked for almost 15 minutes, um, I want to check in with everyone because we haven't seen each other in a whole month. Uh, so I'm going to check in with Jan and see how she's doing, because I know uh, she and Tonka have been busy. They um, had a wonderful program I think about a week ago uh, on Reiki and it was just fabulous and I loved it. So Jan, are you there or you're not there? She might not be there. So then I'm going to go to you, um, Connie, who is actually Rose Miss, but not. Uh, I am Rose Miss tonight because we're having, uh, as, as Deborah and Rose have been struggling with me, not just the session, but several, uh, we're having technical issues with Zoom. I am really Connie Kohler from Southern California, um, and I am a soft-coated Wheaton Terrier uh, breeder, owner, handler, right. um, and uh, a member of my national and local regional breed clubs. Uh, I have served on the boards, uh, board of directors, both. So I'm very familiar with the whole drill. And uh, I have slept on the floor on arrow beds next to whelping boxes, uh, more than is good for me. Um, and uh, have uh, right now have a mother and son combination. The mom is sleeping on my, my right foot. I hope it doesn't go to sleep. But let me just add, everything Deborah said is absolutely right on when you are looking for a puppy. Let me add a few things. First of all, do your research on the breed first, please, because you will find right off the bat whether or not the dog that you're interested in is right for you and or your family, uh, for your lifestyle. Um, do, you, do you want a lap dog or do you want a border collie who is the original, uh, you know, send me in coach uh, breed and absolutely needs a job. They are the ultimate sheepdog. That that will give you, you know, issue number one. And and I have done herding with my Wheaton, so I know wherever I speak. Secondly, um, after you do your research with the National Breed club website and you can find every national breed club that is registered with AKC uh, the American Kennel Club by going to akc.org and all the breed clubs are listed uh, their website is a little tricky to navigate but you can get there uh, and also UKC has a website same deal and every national breed club has a breeders list of member breeders who have to comply with a code of ethics, which governs general ownership, it governs breeding, and it go governs exhibiting. And as Deborah said, health and testing, uh, health testing and temperament testing are absolutely paramount because. The vast majority of people buying dogs do not want to show. They do not want to do obedience trials. They want a good pet. 
And if the if the pet comes from a litter uh, from show, show champions who have been evaluated for structure, movement, basic soundness, uh, and uh, also health testing and temperament testing, then you've got a good match. And if you've got a breeder, I'll, I'll be even more adamant than Deborah. If you've got a breeder who is absolutely going nuts because you are asking questions, you run the other way as fast as your feet can take you because that is the instant red flag that you don't want to deal with that person. If somebody isn't asking me as a breeder the proper questions, then I know I don't want to deal with them. If their only question is price of the puppy and availability of the puppy, they are off the list. If somebody comes to me either through a phone call or an email and says, I've researched the breed and either I am a prior Wheaton owner or I am very interested in the breed and I've done my research and I found your name on the breeders list and, you know, I just, I want to talk with you, then we've got a relationship going. It so, really is important to do that because I can tell you that a lot of breeders are like, Connie, if you call and ask, do you have puppies and how much are they? Uh, we just immediately, the hair on the back of our neck goes up. Absolutely. And say, hmm. Now I wanted to add, sorry to cut you off, Connie, but I wanted to add Please. that you know, getting a dog from a, uh, a rescue or a shelter is also an opportunity, but you really want to get a dog from a rescue or a shelter that is going to mentor you as well. That's going to have uh, training classes. That's going to have someone you can call in case something goes wrong, because these dogs are dogs that they know a little bit more about than you do, not much. And really should be your partner in navigating the personality of the dog you're picking up from a shelter because the people who are picking up from a shelter are doing wonderful things. However, um, I, I, if you need a certain temperament in your life, then being able to talk to the people at a shelter and seeing whether a dog is uh, a certain kind, I know that that some of the terriers in the in the um, shelters can um, be said to be 30 pounds fully grown. And then when they're fully grown, they're 60 pounds, which might be a little bigger than your HOA allows you to have. Um, or if you're in like an independent living, when you get the puppy and then it turns out to be 60 pounds, that could be a problem. So you really want to be able to make sure that what you're bringing into your life is a dog that you can stay with for the rest of your life. So Connie, I'm so glad you brought up the additional things because you do want to run the other way if either the rescue, the shelter, or the breeder doesn't really want to hear your questions, doesn't want to answer your questions because you really, even if you've had a dog before, you know, all of us have had dogs probably, and we all could use someone to give us some information and help us again. As I was grooming this dog the other night, I went, do I ever want a puppy again? I know, Connie, you know that feeling because when you're starting with an 18 month old with no history on what that 18 month old went through, this is why I always am, am so um, in awe of people who want to pick up a dog who's had years of life before them, maybe good, maybe bad, uh, because you're picking up this slate that is not blank like a puppy um, and you're going to have to adjust to their idiosyncrasies that they can't get over and help them get over idiosyncrasies that they can get over. But when you pick up a puppy, it really is important that that relationship, be it with a breeder, uh, a shelter or um, a rescue is good because the last thing you want is to not have anywhere to turn. And if you adopt um, a Wheaton Terrier, an Irish Setter, or a Golden Retriever from a rescue or shelter, please don't hesitate to call the National Club and ask them for help too, because there might be people in your area. Go ahead. Um, I, I just wanted to add, on that very point, um, I have served as rescue coordinator for my uh, local Southern California uh, Wheaton Terrier Breed Club. Southern California covers nine counties going from Central California, Bakersfield, all the way down to the Mexican border and east to Nevada and Arizona. That's Southern California. West is the Pacific Ocean. 
<laughs> so I had, a, I was on a first name basis with the county animal, um, uh, uh, animal control organizations and multiple municipal uh, city uh, animal control organizations in those nine counties. And I will tell you, absolutely, it's, you know, on, on, on a stack of Bibles, the vast majority of shelter workers, and they are wonderful, and they are horribly overworked, especially in, in um, an area like ours, uh, because the shelters are all overcrowded. They don't know. They literally do not know a golden retriever from a soft-coated Wheaton Terrier. And I actually got um, uh, an email from the Orange County <laughs> Animal Shelter for a Wheaton Terrier. And I looked at the picture and I'm a golden retriever auntie. And I said, oh my God, that is a purebred golden. So uh, I called I called the Golden Retriever Club of, of Greater Los Angeles. Immediately they went and they got the dog who was 18 hours from being euthanized. Totally, yeah. totally fine seven-year-old dog. Yeah. Found a wonderful home. So um, if you are going to adopt, which is a wonderful thing, go straight to your local or your national breed clubs. They either have rescue teams within the clubs themselves, or they have adjunct organizations, which are 501c3 organizations like we do, um, which vet the dogs in terms of health and temperament first before they deem them adoptable. And then you can, you can actually go work with uh, those rescue organizations in that breed, and they will mentor you for life yeah. with that Absolutely. dog. They will. Absolutely. Um, Paul, I see that your baby's in the picture. How are you doing? It was a long, she's well. I mean, I'm well, I'm doing okay. She's a work in progress. How I'm, long have you had her? I picked her up on January 28th of a year ago, 2022, in a snowstorm, mm -hmm. Friday night, the night that, uh, Four police officers were ambushed and they had the funeral at St. Patrick's. Oh, God. Four hours <laughs> to get there to go 10 because I'm I'm 20 minutes from like 68th in York. Yeah, and this was, yeah. Yeah. But she's marvelous dog who is a rescue. Where How was I going? She when you got her, Paul. I'm sorry. Say it again. How old did they think she was when you got her? She was an owner surrender and they, the rescue said she was between three and five because the owner, for whatever reason, really didn't give her age. Yeah. But he showed the papers, which was interesting, I guess. I never met the owner. It was an owner surrender. Right. They were moving, which kind of a lame excuse. Well, it's a lame excuse, but they were moving. And they wouldn't wait three days for the rescue to pick her up. So <laughs> they took her to New York City Animal Control on 110th Street and First Avenue, which is where I actually met her. But the rescue, before they even got there, when they said, we can't wait, we're taking her over. So rescue, Long Island Pit Stop, I'll put in a, I'll put in a, what's the word, promotion for... And Karina Canine, Katrina, no, Karina Canine. So they pulled the, they pulled Sasha. She came as Sasha. They pulled Sasha right away. So she was never up for adoption. I met her on a Sunday before I, before the Friday I adopted her. I met her Sunday. She couldn't have whelped more than a month before because she had had puppies. I, they spayed her because animal control does not release a dog that. yeah and most rescues require it too uh purebred rescues they, require it as well yeah well but because they surrendered the dog to well they took the dog to they took sasha to animal control so they wouldn't release to the rescue until spain and rather than get into all that where allegedly well not allegedly but medical record shows that during the spaying they nicked a they nicked her spleen, which mm. I don't know. The uterus is not near a spleen, but 
maybe it was a, a what do you call it a clerical error who knows my vet says that she had had i had i had made an appointment two weeks before getting her just in case you know vets were backed up for over four right. weeks so i made the vet appointment on for a monday thinking i'd get her anyway and as luck would have it i picked her up friday so she already i didn't cancel the vet appointment so we t we went monday they told me the vet said she did not have just one litter. She had had a prior litter at least. Wow. And so they made money off puppies because they showed papers, but they wouldn't give it. And I've had show dog German shepherds. So I never showed, I never, like you had said, most or no, the other lady had yeah, said, said nobody, right. I never, I did Schutzhund, right. but I did not, I was not an avid Schutzhund where many people were at the but she's been a work in progress it, it was a very rough six months so she Only, wasn't necessarily well trained when you got her she was trained she would i learned german for the dog good for I, you I had because she wasn't listening to me really. And so I used Google Translate, no Spanish. I didn't know what these people were. They might have been Russian, but I don't know. But I used anyway. And then she understood um, seat plots. She, if I said plots, she plotched. Right. And um, so that's how you knew she had a different language for her command, I, which I, would have was, been great had you known that, right? Had I. I'm sorry. Had you known that when you first got her, that if the owners had said, listen, she responds to German, not to English, it would have been good for you to know. It would be better because she wouldn't come. I would call her. She wouldn't come. I would yeah. Komen or Kom. It's what was it? Kom, Kom or Komen, K-O-M-M-E-N. But anyway, um, but a dog doesn't have to know the language. They can use, you can use, one can use hand gestures. Right. The trainer, so I hired a trainer based on who a different rescue recommended. He came to my house. I paid him a fortune, $2,000. Wow. Yeah, $2,000. He came in two, three, four. The fifth time, he was supposed to come seven. I just, at the fifth time, I realized it wasn't working out. He made her worse in every way. Yeah. Even worse. She was... She bonded with me within a day. Well, that's good. That's like I, the dog with my neighbor. She's very bonded now um, to my neighbor. So she's actually doing pretty well. And I, I actually saw them go out and she wasn't tripping her, which is always a plus. Uh, well, she bonded right away with me. I really liked her. I couldn't bond at the beginning because going outside was, she's a, she was, well, she's still... She's come a long way. She was highly reactive. Yeah. She was two out of 10. When I first got her, two out of 10 people might be tolerable. She was she, <laughs> was she afraid of them or was she aggressive toward them? Ag aggressive, aggressive exponentially. I wow. mean, she may. God, God bless you, Paul, for adopting her because that's that's huge, and that she liked you and bonded she with you may, right away. She may have been a guard dog, for all I know. I don't. Maybe that's why she learned new German. I don't know, but she was extremely protective of me. Extreme. I've had four German shepherds. I never had to hire a trainer. I trained other people how to train their dog. Right. Dogs. With Sasha, I could, and she came as Sasha. So, and I like the name, so I can. I wasn't going to change the name anyway, but um, especially it, uh, at that age, it's really hard unless you get a name that sort of sounds like it. So, I'm so glad. I'm going to go to someone else for a minute. Um, hmm. I'm so glad but that I will say, to come. Just to comment on the, what was already said, yeah. one must vet a breeder because whether or not it's AKC, and not against anything with the AKC, but um, being a lawyer. Everything is what it seems just because they have AKC papers. It, AKC paper doesn't mean much. It doesn't. You it's only one indicia and yeah. Yeah. I have to agree, Paul, you really have to ask questions. And as Connie and I said, 
if you ask questions and there's pushback, um, then you really need to go the opposite way. I don't know if your rescue gave you pushback when you asked questions or they were supportive. I'm hoping they were very supportive because God bless you for taking Sasha with such a, a need to be um, uh, loved and guided to be a better citizen. Well, it takes, I, I got rid of the first trainer just to, because a German shepherd is very, uh, a female is more territorial than the male, number one. I've had four female German shepherds. She's the fourth, but yeah. more territorial than the male, number one. And the only other thing I'll add is um, the breed, with regard to the breed rescue, um, the best advice I ever got when, when, I, when I got my first German shepherd in the 90s, Chelsea, she came from a great place. Um, she was she was show dog, but it took six months to find a German shepherd who would be good. And she lived to 15 years old. God. But the best. Yeah. 15 was. Yeah. And you. But the best advice I got was from the trainer. I'll never forget his name, Jack. He was a thin, like six foot guy, very thin, maybe 170 pounds. And he said from the northern. It was a German Shepherd Dog Club in my area. So I'm not going to identify which one. Right. But to make a long story short, he said, I would not buy a dog from anyone in this club. And he was the trainer for the club. Wow. And he was, and he was right. But anyway, so that's my... That's uh, Sasha's story. I'm so glad you had that story because it, it is important for people who want yeah. to get a dog and maybe not a puppy and maybe from a rescue or even a puppy from a rescue. You really do need to have the ability to either learn um, from them who a trainer or who a breed specific or someone who might have a dog like that could help them because you really don't know what you're getting into, especially if you're not a breeder and you're just a pet owner and you haven't had as many dogs as you've had, Paul, you really want to make sure you have someone to talk to. So I'm going to check in with Susan. How's Maggie, Susan? Well, well, Maggie is still. doing well. Um, you know, we continue to work with Doug Pointer. How's he that going? It, it's going Okay, um, we still have not gotten her on a leash yet, uh, but we're working with a high value treat called Happy Howie. I don't know if it's a healthy treat or not, but uh, Maggie loves it and it's been helpful. So great. Yeah. And I'm, so is she now still nipping or she's not nipping as much? Not as much. She's Good. not barking as much. Uh, you know, she's put on a ton of weight. And I don't know if it's just because she's gotten lethargic from all the weight that she's put on or whether it's a true shift well, did, in her. Did, um, did um, the trainer, uh, I forgot his name, it went right out of my brain. Doug, Doug Pointer. Doug, Doug, so Pointer. Doug tell you not to feed her except for treats if she's going to get extra heavy because you definitely don't want um, a Catan to get very heavy. That will really be long-term issues for her. Uh, and she's only what going to be four, right? She'll be four next month. Yeah. Right. August uh, 14th. So, so she'll be. Yeah. So, so ask Doug next time he's there, say, listen, she's gained a significant amount of weight on these treats that we love. Should I not feed her? Do you free feed her or do you uh, leave her um, without, do you uh, give her a specific amount? Well, we give a specific amount. We get a prescription from a uh, farmer's dog and they they tell you how much to put out. Doug said well, you, you could might probably- call them and say that she's getting fat. What should we do? And talk to them because maybe they're sending you a specific amount for um, an active dog of her type and she's right. not as active. And so maybe using half of what they tell you to use for about a week. I mean, she might be ravenous, but then she'll be more happy for the treats. Um, but that way she won't gain so much weight because I know when I train, um, I give my dogs most of their food through training um, treats as opposed to um, training treats on top of their food because then they become beach whales. Uh, so um, <laughs> that's what she Doug. looks like now, yeah. a beach whale. <laughs> so ask Doug and say, listen, you know, it seems that the treats are great. She loves them. She's getting much better. However, um, I'm 
I'm going to cut her food back because she's significantly gained weight on the treats. Um, usually we do talk about that and maybe Doug missed that point when he was, um, you know, having you do the training treats and things because it's really important. That's another thing for puppies. Make sure that if you're going to give them treats, you take, you make sure they don't have high protein because puppies don't do well with high protein. Um, it, at least for the first year, um, and make sure you don't give them too many because the raging yuckies in puppies can cause all sorts of issues like telescoped it intestines and things. You really need to be very um, uh, scarce with uh, additional treats. If you want to give them a treat, give them, you know, take a handful of the kibble that you're going to give them for food pull it out of the bowl and then give that to them during the day as a treat. Cause they don't know. They don't know till they're older that they don't like their kibble as treats anymore. I know that probably Connie can, can agree that when we start training, we start training by taking kibble out of the bowl um, because they, they love to eat. They don't know what they're eating. They love to eat. Um, Jan, you- I just, I just have one thing to add, please. Sure. Uh, Deborah, Susan, have you had um, her thyroid uh, her thyroid checked? You know, I haven't, and I've been a little bit negligent in her health care. I, I do need to get her out to the vet, um, you know, and have her checked. But um, we were kind of focusing on the training. Um, and, you know, Deborah, you brought up a point about dogs that are raised in a pack, that they're a little bit wilder. Yeah. And I know that when Ma- we got Maggie, she there were a lot of animals that the breeder had on her, she had like a compound. With, yeah. Uh, and I'm just wondering if that may be the reason. Well, how old was Maggie when you got her? She was two months. Well, no, she probably was only with her sisters and brothers then. She wouldn't have been with the bigger dogs. At 18 months, they're with the bigger dogs, which is why I'm waiting patiently and hoping my neighbor's dog is not bred um, okay. because when they're running okay. in packs like that. Things can happen because they can come into season if they're girls, uh, but we'll see. Um, but no, at eight weeks, you don't let anybody run in a pack at eight weeks. She probably didn't have a lot of the um, hands-on that some breeders do, like Connie and I, when they're in the whelping box. Like Connie said, she slept next to the whelping box for weeks. I do too. I'm always tossing the puppies around so they know, you know, what, human touches and that it's good and that, you know, they don't bite and things like that. Uh, so I, I'm sure Connie, you've lost many a toe, um, with sharp teeth when you're in the wealthy box with them. <laughs> and um, also sprouting arterial blood. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Cause those sharp teeth will take you out. They will take They're razor blades. They're razor blades. Um, so I think Jan, are you there? Or you're, you're watching from afar and can't get off, um, mute. Yes, thank you. Um, I was on. Um, I was driving, <laughs> so I'm now. I'm now where I'm supposed to be. Um, so no, it was a great conversation. Um, you know, my my only comment about doing um, a rescue is yes. Uh, you know, every dog comes with a history, and a lot of times we don't know that history. And if you can, sometimes it helps to actually get the dog gen- genetically tested. Um, to see what breeds, um, sorry, I'm dog sitting and I have like multiples today. Um, so if you can just, um, at least get the, see if you can get genetic testing. Cause sometimes it does give you an idea of their background and you kind of know what you're working with. Um, then if it is, um, a rescue and do your due diligence because they, you know, rescues want to get dogs into homes and they're not necessarily honest some of the time. Um, I found, um, you know, so that was just my experience with being told like dogs were cat friendly and they weren't and things like that. So, you know, yeah, just- and you have to be able to talk to the rescue if they tell you it's cat friendly and it isn't because then you're going to have to work with them to either unfortunately give the dog back if that's an if that's a deal breaker for you or figure out what you can do because you don't want to traumatize the cat either i mean the cat was usually there first you don't want to traumatize the cat so that's really important to make sure um that you have a relationship as as connie and i both said and i have to uh, agree you really need to make sure um that you can have a conversation with whomever you're getting your dog from be it a rescue or a breeder 
um, or a preservationist breeder who has you sign a contract and gives you, you know, a list of things to do for the rest of your life with the dog and will always take it back. And some even refund your purchase price for the life of the dog to make sure you give it back. Uh, because I can tell you, when you were talking, um, Paul, I can tell you that if this person actually bought the dog from a Schutzen, um, it could be that the reason they didn't leave the papers, now you're an attorney, so you'll understand what I mean. The reason they didn't leave the papers is because they signed a contract that said they couldn't place the dog because I know I had to sue someone to get a dog back that they had signed a contract with me um, where they had to return it for a full refund. Uh, and they chose not to do it because, you know, they said, well, um, I just didn't I didn't want to put up with you telling me that I had done something wrong. And I said, well, I apologize that you would have thought I would have done that. I said, that was not anything I said, but I have to tell you that the dog has to come home. And of course she told me that that was never happening. So of course I found the dog and got the dog home. Um, and then ironically returned it to the person she'd given it to because he was a lovely guy, but he wouldn't talk to me. And good breeders never want to lose connection with their dogs. And so if he had given that paper in and you had called Deborah Hamilton of Schutz and whatever, um, and they had found out that you had the dog, um, I would hope that they would um, be very nice to you. Uh, I would hope that they would want to enter into a contract with you like the one they had with their other owner. I'm sure they'd be pissed as hell and sometimes people react um, and are angry when their contracts are broken. Um, I know I was. Uh, it's it's better if you can sort of diffuse the conflict. That's where I am, of course, now in my practice. Uh, this was, oh God, Thomas is 30. So this was 30 years ago. Um, so I have to say that it really is um, something that makes it, oh, I didn't get to Stephanie shoot, um, makes it really difficult to um, to have purebred dogs because people don't necessarily call you if they want to get rid of it because they they read the contract. It has a bunch of things they have to do and they go, well, I'm just going to put it in a rescue. And that's why the blessing of microchips now, um, that's why if it goes in a microchip and you have the dog registered to you as a breeder, the microchip company um, may call you uh, if in fact they don't get the other person um, or if the other person's gotten and they go, well, I don't want the dog anymore. You can give it to a shelter. They may or may not call the second number. So there are so many things to consider when you're either adopting a dog or you're getting a puppy. Um, to wrap up, I'm sorry I missed Stephanie. I think the other caller is Kathy McNamee. Kathy, are you driving and can talk or you can't talk? Um, I, I'm, I just unmuted myself. I've been listening. Um, no, and I, I'm, I know I'm, you have. I'm still not there yet. Yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, you do. Okay. So I know that you got a dog who was older too in Gracie and you were able to talk to the breeder and get some information about Gracie. Uh, yes, I got wonderful information. Um, and I, I got papers and health records and truth. Um, but I would just agree with what I've heard that if when you ask questions, the person you're speaking to, the breeder, is not happy with you asking questions, I'm probably the fourth person who has said, turn around and run away. Um, I, to me, if, if I were in the position of being the breeder looking for a good home, I would want people to ask question after question after question. Um, so I was very lucky. Yeah, because uh, I think Gracie was, what, three when you got her, right? And now she's six. Well, she was one and a half when I got her. Uh, and she had had one litter, um, and she was a show dog, but not winning. That's why they bred her thinking that she would, uh, grow more coat and she didn't. So they then decided to place her in a, in a pet home. Um, and you and were there, so, lucky you. pardon me. I said, and you were there, lucky you for Gracie. Um, I, I was, yes, well, lucky for Gracie, but also very lucky for me. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, guys, it's 716. I'm so glad all of you are here. The topic tonight, of course, was you know, how to find a puppy, how to find a rescue, questions to ask, and the trials and tribulations. Thank you to Paul. Thank you to Connie. I'm sorry I didn't get to Stephanie. Thank you to Susan and to Kathy um, and Jan for giving us some comments on both adopting rescue dogs and uh, adopting or buying dogs from uh, breeders. If you, so the takeaway here is get to know the breed that you want before you go to pick it up, understand what it's all about. If you can buy from a reputable preservationist breeder, great. If you can't and you want to go to a shelter and you're looking for a dog, make sure that you find um, a shelter that's going to work with you and answer your questions. And no matter what breeder you go to, whether it's a preservationist breeder or someone who just breeds like a hobby and may or may not do all the testing, and that's okay for you, that's fine. But if they will not mentor you and they will not answer your questions, please think twice about picking up the puppy. Um, and until next time, this is Deborah Hamilton. You're on the map call. And I hope I see some of you next Wednesday as I give this program to the um, Animal Medical Center's uh, group of clients who they provide additional information for. So until then, kiss your babies for me. Bye now.